It's my real pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Chris Manning. Chris is the Siebel Professor of Machine Learning at uh, Stanford University, where he has a joint appointment in computer science and, and linguistics, re reflecting his broad and multidisciplinary background. He's also the director of the Stanford AI Lab and is one of the uh, folks on the advisory board of a new human-centered AI initiative at, at Stanford. So you can see the breadth of his, uh, his influence at, at Stanford and, and be well beyond that. He's very, very well known for his work on statistical natural language processing, ranging from more linguistic perspectives on parsing and grammar induction to uh, more machine learning perspectives, including his recent work on GloVe and, and many other techniques that leverage large-scale data to solve very interesting problems. Um, Chris is amazingly well-known in many different communities. He has over 100,000 citations. Uh, he has... <laughs> yeah, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> you can figure out how many that is per waking hour since he published his, his first paper. It's probably more than one. Uh, but he, he, another part of his influence, I think, goes above and beyond his his research that spans both uh, <coughs> spans language, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, information retrieval. He's a fellow of all three of the major societies in computer science, uh, linguistics, and AI. But he's also contributed to the field in, in many other ways. He's the author, a co-author of two really important books, on, one on the foundations of statistical NLP and another on um, in modern information retrieval. But he's also, with his students, developed many tools that are shared. How many have used the Stanford parser, at, at the Stanford NLP tools? Uh, he's shared code of all kinds. He's shared representations, things that arose out of his work on, on GloVe. And so Chris, uh, I think, is a real scholar in many senses of, of that, that word. What he's going to do today is, is talk to us about how we can go, right now, if you look at language and uh, representations, many of them focus on understanding the relationships among words, similarity structures in, in words. But he's going to talk uh, much more broadly about how we can bring notions of memory, attention, compositionality, and reasoning to develop systems that have much more intelligence than many of our, our current systems. So Chris, without further ado, thanks. Okay, good morning, and thank you, Sue, for that very kind introduction. I hope I can live up to it, and thanks to everyone um, for coming to the talk. Yeah, so today what I want to do is talk about some of our recent work on trying to build neural networks that can reason, and this is joint work with my student, Drew Hudson. So our current neural network machine learning systems truly excel on a variety of tasks, such as speech recognition and computer vision. And interestingly, they've even been pushed with surprising success to other tasks which you'd think involve higher level reasoning and understanding. A notable success has been the development of neural machine translation, which has worked exceedingly well. But in some sense, even neural machine translation has approached things as a stimulus response task that you're provided, here's the input sentence, produce the output as a kind of a statistical association task. Um, so these kind of tasks don't require deliberate thinking or reasoning. The kind of um, processes that Daniel Kahneman has referred to as thinking slow. So what can we do about reasoning? Reasoning is central to figuring out a good approach when humans are faced with a new problem or in developing longer term plans for a higher level objective. Um, can we use neural networks to do the kind of more deliberate, conscious, multi-step thought? So that might be things like middle school style reading comprehension problems, which aren't really like what most of the current reading comprehension and question answering data sets are like, but much more understanding, a broad understanding of the characters and what they're doing in a novel. Um, common sense reasoning and problem solving, working out plans, um, playing a strategic game. For tasks like this, we really need 
um, better notions of having knowledge, reasoning, and inference. So what then is reasoning? How can reasoning, which has traditionally been thought of in connection with logics and hand-built knowledge representations, be learned by the kind of distributed representation computation units of deep learning? So one inspiring viewpoint on this was provided by Leon Botu in 2011, who suggested that the heart of reasoning is having the means for algebraically manipulating previously acquired knowledge in order to answer new questions. Um, so Batu suggested that we could seek to enhance deep learning systems with reasoning capabilities by, from the ground up. That reasoning is not necessarily achieved by making logical inferences, that he saw a kind of continuity between algebraic, algebraically rich inferences and connecting together trainable learning components. And in particular, he emphasized that central to reasoning is composition rules to guide the combinations of modules to address new tasks. And so one of the things I want to think about today is how can we start to build composition rules for multi-step reasoning in neural networks. And so underlying this um, is some kind of a conception as to where things might head in deep learning. So in, in some sense, the dominant viewpoint in the deep learning community is to seek a learning device that is as, is as empty as possible, some kind of tabula rasa. And so what's happened in a lot of recent work is that the emptiness of the machine learning device is compensated for by providing extra information in the input. So a very successful technique in recent years has been data augmentation. So effectively, you're providing lots of extra input. So in a vision system, you rotate the images a little and shave off a few pixels and change the coloration and things like this, where you're saying all of that your model you want to build should be invariant to all of those things. Um, however, I believe that we shouldn't be afraid of good inductive biases, of thinking about how we could design our neural network systems so that they are built so that they have the ability to learn quickly and well. And that probably having that kind of architecture, some architectural constraints is vital to how human beings are able to learn so quickly and well. Indeed, I think the biggest breakthroughs in deep learning have come from building the right kind of inductive biases, sort of structural priors into models. Now, of course, you can fail if you build models with too rigid structure, but we succeed by finding appropriate but flexible structural priors. So these successes include convolutions, which have been central to work in vision, um, the notion of attention, which has been very central to a lot of the recent advances in natural language processing and other areas. Um, also, the kind of gating that you find in LSTMs or highway networks is, again, building in a good structural prior into your models. In my early deep learning work, I was a strong proponent of the idea of tree-structured compositional models. I believe that that gave the right inductive bias for many human language tasks and also some, other t some tasks in other domains. So the model was that you would take um, pairs of vectors, which would initially be vector representations of words, and then you'd build from that a vector representation of a phrase like very good here, and then you could continue applying the same pairwise composition operation recursively, and you could build up representations of phrases and sentences. And we were able to apply this model with some success to various tasks, including sentiment analysis. So here, um, the model could start reading the sentence. There are slow and repetitive parts and start to build up a composed structure where it says, well, that's a negative um, um, impression, but it has just enough spice to keep it interesting and it builds up a representation where that part of the sentence <laughs> is positive and the positivity wins out so that overall this is a positive thing to say about a movie. 
Um, these models um, aren't only applicable to language. You can actually apply the same ideas in vision. So that visual scenes also commonly have a compositional structure. And so in these experiments that we did on the Stanford background um, data set, that is building up a compositional representation of a church from the pieces of the building and is using that to understand this visual scene. Interestingly, um, what Botu suggested in 2011 as a model for reasoning was essentially exactly the same kind of tree structured recursive neural network that we started employing for natural language. He proposed that the path to universal composition was that you built an association module, A in this picture from his paper, um, that maps two representations taken from memory um, of into a new representation of the same sort, and that that new representation can be scored by a module R in this picture um, to guide inference, and simultaneously the new representation can be put back into the short-term memory where it can be used recursively to build up a proof tree. However, um, for reasons of partly computational efficiency and partly um, limitations and flexibility, it turns out that tree structured composition hasn't really won out in neural network research in the last five years. Um, but you know, there are alternatives. So one that I already mentioned was this idea of attention. I mean, if you look at it, you can think of attention as almost trees by another name because we're effectively putting a sort of a soft tree structure over the previous nodes um, to generate a representation of the next node. And we can apply that um, recursively as we work building up along the sequence. Um, but we now have sort of soft weights rather than a rigid tree structure. You can, a second alternative um, for building up so, something like Batu's function that takes multiple arguments is to think that maybe our neural networks could do what logicians call currying. So rather than having multi-argument functions um, like f that's taking three arguments x, y, z, we could instead build intermediate compositions. So we can take one argument at a time like x and build an intermediate representation or function which can then take the next argument y and proceed to build up an overall representation. And it seems reasonable to assume that neural sequence models could do this kind of computation. So in this current line of work, the hope is that we could start exploring neural network architectures so that rather than having um, big, fairly unstructured neural networks that act as um, association engines or correlation engines um, that look just for any kind of patterning in the input, we could use a model that is more structured with a prior that encourages compositional and transparent multi-step reasoning. Um, however, we'd like to do this in models that are still practically usable. And so for the models that we've built, um, we've focused on models that are still end-to-end -end differentiable. There's a ton of work now on building reinforcement learning models um, in which this is not true, but um, I still, see, I still see the simplicity of end-to-end -end differentiable models as so much easier to train and work with. Um, and also it provides us in a space where it's easy to build models that are still scalable um, to reasonably large problems. So in the work today, I'm going to concentrate on showing results from the area of visual question answering. So here we're shown a picture and we're asked questions about it. And the suggestion is that asking questions is a good way to assess understanding. Um, this was a viewpoint that was put forward very early on. Um, so long ago, there used to be the Yale AI School. Who here is old enough to have heard of the Yale AI School? Yeah. <laughs> That's about <laughs> two or three people. Um, and so one of the early members of the Yale AI school was Wendy Leonard, um, who worked on 
question answering, and she writes, um, when a person understands the story, they can demonstrate their understanding by answering questions about the story. Since questions can be devised to query any aspect of text comprehension, the ability to answer questions is the strongest possible demonstration of understanding. Um, the same is true for visual scenes. Um, and why I've been interested in visual question answering is because it's just seemed like a better proving ground for compositional reasoning. Although there has been a ton of work, which I've also been involved in, in doing textual question answering systems, in general the textual question answering work has still been dominated by lexical semantic matching and there just hasn't been very much opportunity to do multi-step iterative reasoning in that domain um, where it seemed like um, visual question answering gave a kind of a nice place Around to be looking at multi-step compositional reasoning. Okay, so that's my intro on trying to go from machine learning to machine reading. And so for the rest of the talk today, um, I first of all want to tell you about our initial work on Mac networks on the clever task, then tell you a little bit about a new data set, GQA, that we've developed more recently for visual question answering, and then tell you about uh, more fresh off the press um, neural state machine model for doing visual question answering. Okay, so let's just start off with the clever data set. Um, so the clever data set came out of considerations of visual question answering. And so the belief of um, some of the people working in visual question answering that, that the, the most used um, visual question answering tasks which came from um, Batra and Parikh's um, group at Georgia Tech, um, that it had sort of led to some kind of research on language and vision, but it hadn't really um, been a very good testing ground for actually doing scene understanding and compositional reasoning. Um, and so Justin Johnson and colleagues at Facebook AI Research decided that they should try and come up with a diagnostic data set that especially focused on compositional language and visual reasoning about scenes. And so they went back to this old classic of AI blocks world. And so they um, synthesized block world scenes in Blender. Um, and then um, they asked long compositional questions about um, these scenes. Um, so in this one, um, there is a purple cube. So there are some purple cubes, but this one is behind a metal object. So there's a metal object. So that seems it has to be this purple cube um, that is left to a large ball. Um, well, there's a large ball and it's left of it. Um, that seems hopeful. Um, what material is the cube? And if you haven't seen this data set before, you'd probably say no idea. Um, but it turns out in this data set, all things are made out of two materials. They're either metal or rubber. Um, so if they're not shiny, the right answer is rubber. Um, okay. Um, and so a number of people have worked on um, systems um, to approach this data set. Um, but as well as the scene and um, the question and answer, another attribute of this data set, um, which was um, a ref reflection as to how it was constructed, that on the right hand side, um, there's a sort of informal representation of a functional program. So the way that this data set was constructed was that they were building functional programs that they could run on um, these data on the visual scenes in an abstracted form and get out of them um, the answer and then that functional program um, was converted into natural language. And so one of the questions on using this data set that will come up again later is are you just building a system over just um, textual questions and answers and images or are you making use of these this functional program as added supervision? So one of the example of a piece of work that has made use of the functional program has been a line of work by Jacob Andreas and then by Justin Johnson himself that has explored neural module networks. 
So these are partially differentiable models that try to approach the problem compositionally, but they rely on the strong supervision of the functional program to translate queries into a tree-structured functional program. So that the first part of the model um, is a LSTM encoder-decoder model that reads the textual question and produces the functional program. And then the second part of it is another neural network which interprets this functional program. So that neural network is built out of custom building blocks for these different semantic operations. So there's a counting neural network and a comparing neural network and a filtering neural network and they're plugged together in a compositional way and they interpret this functional program and then aim to give the answer from it. Okay, but what I want to do um, to first today is to introduce our version of approaching this problem, um, which is the MAC network, which stood for memory attention composition as a neural model for problem solving and reasoning tasks. Um, so we want to have this idea of um, building a network with structure that encourages it to do multi-step reasoning. So it should decompose a problem into a sequence of explicit reasoning steps and each of them is, um, corresponds to one max cell in our network. But on the other hand, um, it didn't seem right to us the kind of neural module network approach that I just showed on the previous slide, that it seemed much too bespoke by the time you were custom designing um, individual network units for comparison, filtering, counting, and things like that. That didn't seem sufficiently generic as a model of intelligence. So what we wanted is one universal max cell that could be used to be for everything. And it's versatile enough that it can learn to do different things depending on the context in which it's applied. And what we're building is a recurrent neural network um, but the recurrent neural network is able to um, have attention backwards throughout a sequence of reasoning steps. And so through attention, it can in a soft way represent a complex reasoning graph, and, but in a model that still has end-to-end -end differentiability. And so each max cell is sort of one step of a reasoning system. And so the design we had is sort of a more articulated design than most standard recurrent neural networks since it, um, the model retains two recurrent states. So it has a control state which is used to describe the reasoning operation of the network and the control state is an attention-based average of a given query, which in our case is just the textual question. Um, and then there's a memory state which is based on information which in general we'd say has been collected from a knowledge base but in the particular application here the knowledge base is simply the image that the system is looking at and so the memory is going to be represented as an attention based average over our image or over our knowledge base. So there are a couple of things um, that are worth at least noting here. Um, one is that in our model we're not going to make use of the strong supervision of the functional programs at all. We're simply working from the question and the picture and attempting to get the answer. The other one is this design choice um, that we're representing thinking in terms of attention. So attention-based averages over a given query and attention-based averages over the image. Um, the second model I show later does things a bit differently and has more abstraction. We'll get to that later. But it also represents everything as attention-based averages. Um, and I can't prove anything here. This is just a bet. But it seemed to us that the use of attention-based models of this sort has proved to be very successful. Um, an immediate good property of these kind of models is that attention gives the kind of easy interpretability. You can say what words is the model looking at and what part of the picture is the model looking at. But beyond that, it seems that by grounding our models in the space of attention-based averages, that that's appears to be a, 
a useful way to somehow c constrain and direct the models and get them to learn more effectively than if we just have unconstrained hidden states. <coughs> Okay, in slightly more detail, um, so here is our max cell. So on the top part of the max cell, we have the control unit, which computes a control state. So it takes in um, the question text and the previous control state, and it'll generate a new control state by focusing on some aspect of the query. And then down in the bottom, we have the memory. So this part takes in a preceding memory hidden state and our so-called knowledge base here, um, the image. Um, and based on um, the control information and the previous memory state, um, it reads some information out of the knowledge base or image. And then that generates a new candidate memory, which is combined with preceding um, memories to generate a new MI memory unit, which is then written um, into the next memory state, merging old and new information. Um, and so the bet here is, at the time we first started um, this work, um, there had been some quite prominent work from DeepMind on neural Turing machines and then differentiable neural computers. And it seemed that although, you know, in theory those models were very powerful, it seemed like in practice they were very difficult to control. And indeed, I think to this day they haven't been demonstrated on any larger scale um, problems. And part of the difficulty comes from the sort of Turing machine style um, arbitrariness of you can read and write anywhere and that makes it very difficult to learn and control these models. Whereas this model has a very simple organization since you're sequentially laying down memories, um, but each next memory can be done based on attention over previous memories. Um, let's see, uh, time goes by fast, so I probably should do this quickly so I get on to the later ones. Okay, um, very quickly, more details in the paper. Um, okay, so the control part um, takes the previous control straight and the query, um, it computes a representation, um, it then uses attention onto the words of um, the, well, actually, I should explain that. For the words of the question, they're run through a bidirectional LSTM, so they're sort of contextual words. Um, so it then uses what it's computed up here to put attention over the words of the query in a standard attention distribution way to produce a weighted average over the words of the query, but normally focusing on certain words, and that gives the next time steps um, control signal. Um, for the read unit, um, that's taking in the previous memory state and the knowledge base, the picture, um, and then it is wanting to get something out of the image. And the early part of that allows the previous memory to interact um, with the image and um, get stuff out of it um, in an associative way. And then it feeds in um, the control state um, and does a second round of using that to put attention over the image. Um, and again, we have a, a weighted, weighted based on attention retrieval from the image, and that creates the new memory state. And so then with, the, well, sorry, the new candidate memory state. So if the, for the new candidate memory state, that then goes into the right unit, and so the new candidate memory state then itself um, is combined with past memory states um, using um, the control state. So the control <coughs> is used to feed which past memory states to pay attention to in a kind of a key value um, attention mechanism. Um, and so that is then used to calculate a sort of a weighted distribution over previous memories, the new memory, and that that then gives you um, the new memory state. And the hope is that we can simulate in that way, doing a kind of a soft 
but arbitrary dag of reasoning of successively writing new memory states. So that's one Mac cell, um, and then we build a Mac network by building a recurrent sequence model um, that runs through a bunch of those cells. And that gives us a model that's efficient, easy to deploy, and still fully differentiable. Um, but it has the capacity to represent arbitrarily complex reasoning by directed acyclic graphs in a soft way through attention. Okay, so let me um, provide, present the results of this in terms of the, initially the clever data set. So it had 700,000 um, training examples, 150,000 test examples. The space of answers is very small. There's metal, rubber, cube, sphere, a um, few colors, very small numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, so the baseline is quite high. So if you answer the most frequent answer by question type, you're already at almost 42%. Um, but what they um, wanted to show is that um, the kind of architectures that had been used for visual question answering, um, sort of CNN stacks plus LSTMs, didn't really work on this data because they didn't do the necessary reasoning. So a kind of a state-of-the-art VQA system at this time a couple of years ago only got 52%. Um, compared to that, neural module networks, this is Jacob Andreas's work, did a ton better, got 83%, which was not too far off um, the 92.6% um, that was reported as human accuracy. Um, but, you know, actually these problems were synthesized, right? So there were synthesized images and synthesized answers um, based on the functional programs. So there's absolutely no reason why a system shouldn't be able to get 100% on this data. And there's a sort of a, actually a fairly artificial reason why human performance was depressed from 100%, not just um, human laziness. And so actually what's happened in more recent work was sort of all of the action moved to the 95 to 100% um, space. Um, and so initially DeepMind came up with a relation network model that got to 95.4%. Um, then Justin Johnson did a new generation of neural module networks um, that got to almost 97%. Um, people in um, Montreal with the film network got to 97.7%. Um, um, and so um, relation networks and film are essentially both large CNN stacks interleaved with specialized layers. So relation nets had a relation net layer where every pair of pixels has relationships assessed between it to understand binary relations. Um, film inserts these conditional linear normalization layers that tilt the activations based on the question. It's hard to get an intuitive sense of what that model does. Um, but anyway, our Mac network works super well. Um, it gets 98.9%, .9 which essentially halves the remaining error. Um, but you might be starting to wonder how meaningful this is when things are getting so close to 100%. So something that I think is interesting is the following, that if we look at learning curves based on how much training data you give to the models. And if you, instead of giving the models 700,000 examples, you only give them 70,000 training examples, then what you do is find that other models, such as the film model or the neural module network model of Justin Johnson, they can't actually learn very much from 70,000 examples at all. Even though 70,000 is a lot, right? This isn't a very big space. You'd think you should have to learn something from, you know, 70 or 100 examples um, that they sort of don't get that far above baseline performance of most common classes, whereas um, our MacNet model is already getting 86% accuracy over 70,000 examples. So I think that's actually an interesting proof that the design of the model has the right kind of priors to be solving these kind of multi-step inference problems. And the subsequent work 
Um, Justin Johnson also built a clever humans data set um, where he collected 18,000 um, real questions from humans through crowdsourcing where they're told to write questions hard for a smart robot to answer. And so these questions have a more diverse vocabulary, um, different kinds of reasoning skills which might not be in the original data set and there's a small training set for fine tuning. So if you run with the original data zero shot on this um, clever humans data set, you get these results um, where none of the systems work great but MacNet does do a little bit better. Um, if you fine tune on the training set, um, you get these results um, where again, um, the MacNet is able to get more value um, from the the fine tuning set than any of the other models. Again, I think reflecting its ability to generalize well from small amounts of data and starts to get quite good performance. Um, here's sort of a couple of examples um, that show how we get the benefits of having interpretable um, reasoning from having um, the attention over both the sentence and our image. So what color is the matte thing to the right of the sphere in front of the teeny blue block? So um, this is a very short example where there are only three reasoning steps. So in the first reasoning step, it focuses on teeny blue block in the language and looks at the teeny blue block. In the second reasoning step, it's the sphere in front and it's then focusing in the image on the sphere in front. And then the third reasoning step is color is the matte thing and it's um, going to the matte thing and asking its color and correctly answers purple. You get better results for longer sequence of reasoning. Um, so here's um, it using six reasoning steps on this um, example. How many objects are either small objects behind the tiny metal cylinder or metallic cubes in front of the large green metal object. And often what you see here is in the first couple of time steps, it more sort of looks at the macro structure of what it's being asked before it starts to focus visually. So initially it's um, looking at the how many, the question type, and well, either small, I'm not sure what it's doing there. But then the second step is realizing it's sort of a disjunction between two things. And then in the third time step, it starts um, focusing on particular things. So large green metal, it's looking at the large green metal. Um, metallic cubes, and it's looking at the metallic cubes. Teeny metal cylinder, and it's looking at that. Um, small objects um, behind things. Um, at any rate, um, it's not quite clear how it does the counting, but it does in this example correctly give the answer of four. So I guess it's managed to somehow um, get that out of the, what's going on. Okay, so that was an initial um, neural compositional reasoning engine. And so I hope I've shown that it seems like we've gotten some good value from having a constrained sequence model with good priors separating out control and memory and exploiting attention. Um, but um, let me move on and get to um, the newer stuff. Okay, um, so one problem is that although there were these early reasoning data sets, including Clever, they seem kind of limited. There's artificial images and or language. There's a very small space of possible objects and attributes. And so although in theory you're doing compositional reasoning, the feeling is that because the amount of data is so large and the space is so small that the suspicion is that these models actually just memorize molecules. So they just learn what a red metal sphere is and that they, therefore they have a lot less compositionality in them than you'd hope they have. Um, on the other hand, the main visual question answering benchmarks have also seemed somewhat problematic. So there are strong, what are often referred to as language biases, but I think it's mainly actually more real world biases and models guess um, based on um, priors. So snow covers the ground, grass is green, and things like that. There's also visual biases to overly salient, salient objects. Um, and it's hard to tell when systems are going wrong what exactly is causing it. Um, and really the questions are too simple. The questions are often um, simply what color is the grass? So little reasoning or compositionality is required. 
And so um, we've worked to produce this new data set for compositional question answering over real world images called GQA. And in some sense, this is clever done on a larger scale. Um, so we've generated, we start with um, real images which come from the same MS Coco sources that everybody uses in the vision world, um, and then generate um, questions involving sort of compositional questions a bit like Clever. And so we generate 10 million compositional questions overall and then generate a balanced smaller set of questions with closely controlled answer distributions. And the way we do that is that we make use of and provide a scene graph with each image that represents its semantics. And then the questions like in Clever come with a functional program grounded in the scene graph that shows its semantics. Um, perhaps surprisingly, um, the questions we build are generated using a traditional rule-based question engine. Um, but you know, this means that it's sort of just sort of the precise semantics um, that a rule-based system can give you, that we're just sort of turning um, the scene graph representation in a very controlled manner into um, question, natural language questions. So it's still a controlled language, but we tried to give much more in the way of linguistic diversity and a large vocabulary. And since we totally can understand the scenes, um, we can have metrics that can assess the consistency of models answers and various other metrics. Okay, so in slightly more detail, um, our starting off point is the visual genome data set um, that my Stanford colleagues, Ranjay Krishna and Michael Bernstein, Fei-Fei Lee and others developed, where you're starting off with the MS Coco pictures and then they're putting over this a scene graph representation shown at right where there are identified objects, which are the um, pink um, things like helmet, watch and man, um, these objects can have attributes, um, silver helmet, black watch, and then they can be connected together by relationship. So the man is wearing a helmet or the cow is kneeling on the grass. Um, we produced the sort of improved visual genome. Um, so rather than just bounding boxes, we made use of the last few years of computer vision technology and now have masks over images. Um, but more importantly, um, the original um, scene graphs are completely unrestrained in their natural language labeling of things. So we move to a clear ontology of concepts by resolving synonyms, discarding some very unclear or rare things. So our ontology has 1,700 objects, 600 attributes, and 330 relations, which are grouped into 60 categories and subcategories. We also augment the graphs with some additional information we put in um, positional relations information, some kind of comparative information of same or different color, and some other global information that seems useful but didn't tend to be in the scene graphs, things about the weather and things like that. Okay, so then once we have these scene graphs, we generate using our rule-based engine um, natural language questions. And you know, this is a conventional rule-based natural language generation system um, with probabilistic rules. So we can have sort of common and uncommon patterns um, with a sort of standard kind of context-free style grammar that can build up descriptions. There's then kind of quite a lot of work behind the scenes, um, which is then trying to make these questions questions be good questions. So we want to make sure they're answerable, they're uniquely answerable, and that they seem reasonably natural. So that, you know, there are sort of uh, actually then a lot of um, large, somewhat induced, somewhat hand-built lexica that underlie what kind of words and natural words to, to use to describe various kinds of relationships that might be more abstractly expressed in the scene graph. And this gives you an idea of the differences between BQA and GQA. So visual question answering has sort of crowdsourced questions and crowdsourced answers in unrestricted natural language. So you know the VQA questions are 
real human questions, um, whereas GQA, um, the questions are more artificial because we're generating them from our grammar. On the other hand, the GQA questions we believe are a better test bed for exploring scene understanding and reasoning um, because the VQA questions are sort of sort of random. Does this man need a haircut? Um, what is different about the man's shirt that shows this is for a special occasion? And rely on a lot of sort of world knowledge that you can't really answer things from the question. Um, our, our questions are sort of more straightforward, scene understanding questions, um, which are perhaps more artificial sounding. Is there a necktie in the picture that is not red? But um, we are at least, we're thinking that this is probably a sort of a better test bed for exploring visual understanding and compositional reasoning um, than VQA um, has provided. And you know, this isn't a one is better, this is sort of better for a certain purpose kind of an answer. Um, here are the baseline accuracies that we got with this new data set. Um, so global prior is if you're just saying, if you're asking a color question and you give the most common color answer, you get whatever, about 17%. This is a vision only model. So there's been a tradition VQA of seeing how far you can get with a vision only model or a language only model. The local prior is um, prior, prior for a particular kind of object. So this is, if you're asking what color is the apple, you do rather better than the global prior. Um, the LSTM is the language only model, and this is the result that's always been shown in current VQA systems that you can do not terribly by ignoring the picture altogether and just answering based on the language that you're given. Um, LSTM plus CNN is sort of the standard baseline um, VQA system. Um, bottom up is the recent kind of winning um, VQA systems of Peter Anderson and colleagues that use bottom up and top down attention. Um, if you look really closely, you'll notice that our Mac model is better than any of these other models. Um, but somewhat disappointingly, um, the Mac model doesn't actually work um, very well on this data set as trying to prove the point of more abstract reasoning. Um, and it's way below our humans that are coming in at about 90% accuracy. Um, so in the last bit of the talk, I then want to tell you a bit about a new model um, that we've been exploring that tries to do somewhat better than this. And so um, the thing that we've been exploring this new model is, so for visual question answering, well, question un answers are clearly about language. Um, but maybe we could actually make more progress on visual question answering rather than having these systems which have vision on one side and language on the other side. If we instead represented what we're doing for visual question answering as doing everything in terms of an internal language of thought. So what we'd like to do is have a common conceptual representation which we can represent both language, which we can use to represent both language expressions and visual scenes um, in, and then we'll be able to reason using that and we'll be able to do better. Okay, so I am no expert on human visual perception, um, but nevertheless my um, superficial understanding of human visual perception is um, the idea that brains have a photo of in their brain that they're using um, isn't supported by most of what's in human visual perception instead that, you know, eyes are making momentary fixations and what they're getting out of each fixation is some kind of very high level scene gist, right? So you do a fixation on the man and you see there's a man who looks like a cyclist with, you know, glasses, um, helmet, gloves, watch, and you're sort of aware of the fact there's a grassland scene with a cow somewhere off to the right, um, but you know, you don't actually get a lot of detail out of that. And then you'll sort of saccade, make another fixation. And maybe you look at the cow and then you'll notice it has horns and a bell on the front or something like that. But it's really that sort of they're fairly abstracted scene gists as what's actually in the brain as you do this visual processing. 
So in the same way, our hope is that we can use um, concepts to organize our visual sensory experience, and we can build from those a kind of a, an abstraction, a world model um, to represent um, what we're seeing in our environment. And our world models will essentially be the scene graphs that I just showed you, um, and that those, we'll be able to use those to draw inferences. And so this sort of fits in with the general deep learning story. So the hope of deep learning models is that we could use the depth to learn higher level abstractions. And the reason why that should be useful is that for surface signals like visual signals, there's all sorts of complications and variations. But if we can build a higher level abstractions, we should be able to disentangle our representations and that will allow us to improve generalization. Um, and so in particular, the way we want to do that is by building a model that does content-based attention over concepts. So attention is our central operation, again, that we're using here. So we're going to have a large set of concepts, and we're going to put attention over a few concepts. And crucially, what we're going to explore here is previously, and in most other vision systems, you're putting attention directly over the image, over pixel space. But here it's arguing that maybe if instead we can put our visual attention over concept space, we'll be able to do rather better, where concept space is our language of thought. So this is sort of related um, to what Joshua Bengio has proposed as his so-called consciousness prior. I'm not sure I like that name, but um, I think the idea is basically right. So um, the general research program is to say that we should try and learn deep representations that disentangle abstract explanatory factors. And then his suggestion is that conscious state is a very low dimensional vector, which is sort of an attention mechanism over uh, um, the um, disentangled deep representation. The way we're doing things is somewhat different to um, what he proposes, but in some sense it's the sort of same ideas of disentangled concept space, putting attention over it. Um, and so this is a model um, of the neural state machine. So we have a vocabulary of embedded concepts, which are our atomic semantic units, and that is our cleaned up visual genome ontology that I told you about earlier. And then, but this time we're going to translate both questions and images into these concepts so that they both speak the same language. So everything is going to be represented as attention over a concept vocabulary. And so we hope that this will give us sort of a model of concept learning and use somewhat similar to what humans might do. Okay, so a neural state machine is a differentiable graph-based model which simulates a state machine. And so in some sense, we're hoping to see it combining some of the strengths of both neural and traditional symbolic approaches. Um, and so this is what we do. We've got two stages of construction and inference. So in the construction stage, we're going to take a image and turn it into a scene graph. And so the way we're doing this is um, following other work that's done image to scene graph. And again, including work by Ranjay Krishna and others at Stanford, we're using similar methods to generate scene graphs from images. We do object recognition and then have um, further components that um, infer relations, attributes of objects and relations between objects. And simultaneously, um, we run a uh, encoder decoder style model over the natural language question and turn into a sequence of instructions which are attention over concepts in our abstracted concept space. And then we're going to do inference, which is going to be a state machine style computation over our graph to compute an answer. So, you know, formally we have something that looks like a finite state machine um, with states and edges. Then there is kind of a sequence of instructions that are going to be sort of like 
um, at our, in import, but we're going to do things in probabilistic manner. So we start with the probability distribution over initial states, and then we have a neural state transition function which computes probabilities of next states based on the current state distribution and what the instruction is. Okay, so this is it all pictorially. So from an image, we construct um, a scene graph, which happens to also look like a state machine, um, um, where the states correspond to objects and the transitions correspond to relations. And the states have these um, properties. And all of this is represented in a soft way as a tension over concepts in our concept ontology. Um, and so effectively, these attentions over concepts give us a disentangled representation in terms of concepts and their properties and relations between them. So it's all factorized using our concept vocabulary. Um, the question is then also translated into a series of instructions. And so each instruction is again an attention distribution over concepts. But if we just go with the argmax of it, um, what is the red fruit inside of the bowl to the right of the coffee maker gets interpreted to instruction sequence of coffee maker right bowl inside red. And so then we can run these instructions on our um, state machine and say, well, start with the coffee maker. You want to look to the right. There should be a bowl there. You want to look inside that. Um, and um, there's something red. Um, and the network will then be able to say, oh, yeah, that's an apple. Um, and will then be able to answer the question correctly. Um, here's one more example of that. So what is the tall object the left of the bed made of? Um, so the model will form the instruction sequence bed left tall made. And so it will first of all um, be looking at the bed, looking to the left of the bed, confirming there's something tall there, um, then asking what it's made of, and it will return the answer red. Um, but, you know, I'm just sort of doing this as sort of one hot one hot language in describing it. Really, at each stage, this is done as sort of soft attention distributions. And at all times, there's a soft, um, a soft activation level over the entire of the scene graph. Um, so here's our new model. Um, so this is over GQA again. So these were all the models I already talked about in Mac. Um, and so we are actually getting a nice lift there um, from the neural state machine model, um, which is now um, working quite a bit better. Um, fine point, you'll notice that Mac's doing a bit better than before as well. You know, it turns out if you tune these models for longer, <laughs> you, can, you can always work out ways to make them do a bit better. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, the neural state machine um, is doing kind of well better than that. And I hope that that's sort of showing um, that, you know, working, having reduced things both to the language of concepts gives you some power. Um, here are a couple more demonstrations. So there's another interesting data set um, that was um, done. Good to know. Um, um, Aishar Agarwal and colleagues from Georgia Tech, where they wanted to sort of give a better test of visual question answering than standard VQA data sets. So they produced this VQA CP data set um, where deliberately the distribution was changed between the training set and the test set. So for example, in the training set for what sport is it questions, the two most common answers were tennis and baseball, but they changed the distribution. So on the test set, the most common sports shown is skiing, then baseball, soccer. Um, skateboarding, etc. So you have a different distribution. And so if you've actually un understanding concepts, um, you should be able to still get the answer right. But if you're just guessing based on world priors, you'll get the answers badly wrong. And so what they showed was most current models. You can see here, here are the neural module networks um, that we talked about before, again, um, and various other models at that point. It seemed like, well, no, actually, they weren't understanding concepts. And so many of these models, their performance essentially halved when you went to the VQA CP um, data set. Okay, um, so 
Stacked attention networks perform terribly on this data set. Um, so Agarwal et al. Um, produced their own model that worked better. And then interesting, this was actually also a model that mapped both images and language to concepts. So they sort of had that idea as well. Um, then here are all the 2019 models on archive, um, which are doing rather better than their model. Um, but um, again, with the neural state machine model, I think we're getting additional power by having this state machine that we can simulate reasoning on. Um, I have one more example of that, but time is going by, so maybe I should um, skip. Five minutes. Do you want? Five minutes. I don't have many slides left, so I could do this example then. Okay, I will. Um, so we can do the same kind of thing um, with GQA, that since we do have scene graphs and functional programs behind all of GQA, we can also do the same trick that they did of changing distributions. So we can, we can have um, distinctions in structure between training and testing. So we can have um, the training only using some linguistic constructs for the notion of covering or what something is made of, and at testing um, doing um, different kinds of questions or we can have different content. So at training, um, we can not have any questions that refer to types of foods or animals. Um, and at testing time, um, we do have questions of that sort. And the fine point here is, I mean, it's not the thing, we don't have, you know, completely novel objects. It's not that we're sort of asking at test time, what's this animal? And it's a red panda and it never saw a red panda at training time. So for objects in isolation, um, we've got our trained object detector, which has seen all of the objects that map onto our concept vocabulary in the training data. But that's only sort of learning in isolation. So this is sort of saying, can it compose together that knowledge to be able to answer um, new kinds of questions that it hadn't been asked about at training time. Um, and so here are our results here. Um, and again, um, you know, the MAC network will argue is a bit along the right lines, but the neural state machine is much more effectively being able to generalize to these new types of questions where some of the sort of more standard um, BQA models, uh, you know, it's not that they don't work at all, but perform fairly um, poorly at generalizing to new types of things like this. So, in conclusion, um, yeah, so, um, so VQA as a problem has always been considerably about language, but I think it might be interesting to explore whether you can think in terms of a conceptual space or a language of thought where you're using a common representation for different modalities for reasoning about, and that might actually give additional power. And I've outlined a model that did that. I mean, in general, I think there's this sort of exciting question of can we take our neural network models that have been so successful for sensory perception tasks and work out whether we can also use them for thinking slow tasks involving understanding and multi-step compositional reasoning. And so the overall um, goal is can we build neural networks that think? And I think there's actually a reasonable hope that we might be able to do that. And I've suggested that at least one promising direction has been to do this by trying to build models which use attention over abstracted disentangled concepts and then do multi-step reasoning by having an iterative attention process over different time steps. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for a fabulous and, and thought-provoking talk. Why don't we spend the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes answering questions and then uh, give you a, a little bit of a break before you head off to your next thing. Sure. You, you can pick. <laughs> okay. Um, a question that I had is like in all of these compositional reasoning data sets, one thing that's clearly missing is hierarchy. So when you show the picture of all these people, like tall woman, short boy, and man, the first thing that came out to me was, wait, it's a family. 
but family was never mentioned in the scene graph. So that has a hierarchy of composition that these four people in the next step actually constitute a family. So do you think we should also be pursuing research in that direction? Yes. I mean, I guess that, yeah, I mean, so I think that's a completely valid observation. And, oh, sorry, the question was, um, these models are doing some kind of multi-step reasoning, yes, but they're not representing hierarchy or perhaps not even really representing compositionality, and it seems like they should. I mean, that actually goes back to this early picture I showed right there, right? I think there's no doubt at all that there's lots of need to represent um, composition hierarchy because sort of a lot of the time, yes, we're sort of thinking in terms of these um, hierarchical models where we're sort of seeing bigger composite holes. And I agree, we haven't really been addressing that, um, but I, I think we should. We sort of did in this old work in 2011. <laughs> um, maybe we'll get back to it one of these days. Uh, I don't know, do I take one? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a question about the, the testing methodology. So at the end, you showed how you know if the, if the distribution on the training and the testing was different, you'd get you know a worse result. Is there any effort to like systematically test like every possible you know object in the scene, or you know it seems like you could be since you're generating these queries and these scenes. Uh, you know, automatically, you could just systematically generate all the possible inputs, right? I mean, so, so yeah, I mean, that's sort of not something I talked about, but I mean, that's actually one of the things that we aim, I guess I was where I was down here, not very, explained very well on that last point. I mean, that was something that we saw as one of the big advantages of this sort of having the controlled questions of GQA that we can generate lots of questions which are effectively answering the same or related things, you know, so we can ask sort of what color is um, the go-kart, is the go-kart red, is the go-kart green, and we could assess automatically whether um, a system is giving consistent answers, and it turns out that a lot of the time VQA systems don't give consistent answers. And you know, we could do that for relational ones as well. We could say, what is to the left of the go card, and maybe there's a person. Then we can say, what is to the um, right of the person, and ask backwards, and so on. So and so, better assess actual understanding rather than random guessing. And so we actually yeah have some metrics that we define that look at consistency of answering and have gotten some results on that. Thanks. Yeah. So I have a question about the uh, neural state machine. Um, currently, I think you have 117 or 1,070 kind of object. And the object recognition on such a large recovery object is, I, I think performance should be very bad. So I. I think it, the accuracy of object detection is even lower than the accuracy of the VQ, kind of the final VQA answer accuracy. So how can you really get such a high accuracy to answer the questions, but based on a very poor performance of object detection? Ah, uh, so I think maybe there are two answers to that. I mean, I think one answer to that is it turns out that a lot of, it's, it's sort of a distribution of data question. It turns out that a lot of the stuff that's in um, the scene graphs that are ultimately come from visual genome, though we've normalized them, is fairly simple stuff, right? That there's a lot of things that's um, talking about people and fruits and cars and airplanes. Um, and so there's a, even though we do some things to rebalance the data, um, that I'll, there are sort of core concepts, basic categories, if you will, in um, psychological terms that are used a lot and are much fewer in number. And so that helps. I think the other part of the answer uh, so is we don't have to get the answer exactly right because at each point we're putting an attention distribution across the space of concepts. And so to the extent that the model roughly thinks that, oh, it's probably one of these four things and I don't know which, 
um, the model can place non-trivial attention over all of those four things and reason forward from there, even though, you know, if it was just guessing at random between them, um, then it would only be getting 25% accuracy. Then we'll, we will have some problem that we get some wrong on object detection, and then the model, the reasoning model learns from this wrong thing, so do something wrong, but then, in fact, final answer is correct. Just like, wrong thing, wrong thing, and then go to right, so we do not learn anything, kind of, uh, we do not learn that useful reasoning there. So there's certainly a chance of um, getting things wrong, but you know, there's also a chance that um, the sort of multi-step reasoning could actually be more human-like, because I mean, if you sort of say a go-kart to the right of a person, well, even if your go-kart um, detector isn't that good, if you know it's to the right of a person, well, you could say, oh, that thing over there, it must be a go-kart, right? And so the actual relational reasoning can actually help you do better. Um, do you want to person behind there? Yeah. Uh, so it seems that there are two main approaches to multi-step reasoning. One is, you know, explicit, modular, uh, with discrete uh, instructions versus, you know, having a universal uh, kind of continuous uh, actions. And it seems that you have tried both of them in, both, in two of your works. One is the max cell, which is a universal cell, as opposed to uh, your recent work, which is more like a discrete uh, instructions. So from your experience, uh, which one of these approaches do you think would be more fruitful to pursue? Um, yeah, so I guess right at the moment I'll say the neural state machine, because <laughs> look, it seems to be working better. Um, but I think, right, so there's clearly a wide open space of approaches, and it's not really clear that I or anyone know the best approach. But um, Right, so in some sense, the neural state machine approach is sort of more specific with its different things compared to the Mac architecture, but it's still not as specific and custom as something like the neural modular networks, right? That it's still being done as sort of, there aren't special units to do anything like spatial reasoning or counting or anything like that, right? Um, that it's still doing a more general attention-based computation. And so in some sense, I still see it as similar to the Mac family. Uh, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> so I have two questions. One uh, is uh, you, the results that you present, they are not based on the ground truth singers. So do you guys have the results for ground truth sync graphs? No object detector, no relation detector, just the ground truth sync graphs and use your architecture on the top of that. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Right, so the question is, um, you're using um, a vision system and there's an answer that you should be able to get where you just say, here's the gold scene graph for this scene, um, run it on that and um, then you should be, like, really you're back in that state then, like you should be able to get 100% off of the question and the gold scene graph. Um, no, I don't have those answers and, you know, it's, that would be an interesting thing to do. I mean, I think clearly it would be much, ha much higher number, right? Because yeah, there's sort of two parts of this question, one of which is what is the difficulty of the vision problem of recognizing things, and the other one is how successfully do you actually reason across these scene graphs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rule out questions from the NLP team and MSRAI and the deep learning team and MSRAI because you're going to meet with Chris over the next uh, few hours. So there any non-MSR AI vision? <laughs> <laughs> lots of them raising hands. Sorry, uh, I have a more high-level question. So uh, if we combine computer vision and NLP, it's VQA or GQA. And my background is ASR. So uh, my question is really, uh, how can ASR be combined with like, or uh, do you think one day we will be working on something like combining all the three areas, ASR, CV, NLP, and yes, yeah. have you asked um, about that? So, uh, yeah, so I haven't done that. Um, so, I mean, in, 
you know, I have nothing against speech recognition, of course. Um, in some sense, sort of speech recognition hasn't seemed the right place to play for trying to do this higher level reasoning. I mean, you know, on the one hand, there's clearly a connection, right? When humans are doing speech recognition, they have a much higher level understanding of where they are and what's being talked about and they use that to help with their speech recognition and you should be able to do the same and so yes we should be able to combine all of these modalities together and do much more. I mean in practice that's tended not to be what happens in speech systems and the speech is recognized to the word level before anything else happens um, and to the extent that that's true it, um, if you're sort of more interested on sort of high level reasoning, um, incorporating in speech hasn't seemed the easy way to sort of make the problem more interesting where doing multimodal work with vision has seemed much more approachable. Anyone on this side have a question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you talked about how uh, the Clever data set was basically a very large amount of data, but like a very small space. Um, and so you basically made a bigger version of that in the form of uh, GQA. So what's the intuition on how complex you want to make this data set so that these high capacity models like don't actually memorize it versus like actually learn to reason on them? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can sort of say my thoughts, but you know, they're, they're sort of, you know, the usual kind of half informed thoughts. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess in research somehow you want to find the right sweet spot where there, things aren't too difficult but it presents the right kind of challenges and questions for what you want to pursue. And you know I guess my feeling coming into this was um, that if you compare textual question answering versus visual question answering that even though there'd been progress every year on visual question answering. There was a way in which the problem seemed sort of too hard and too diverse. So that whereas for textual question answering, there's been a really good ramp. In fact, in some sense, it might seem like it's almost too easy with all of these results on textual question answering, claiming better than human results on squad and other data sets. Um, for visual question answering, it sort of seemed like the space of questions and knowledge and so on was sort of too variegated and hard for the current systems. Um, but on the other hand, the blocks world system seemed like they were too small and too easy. And so, yeah, we were looking um, for something that was sort of in the middle, which presented reasoning challenges over real vision problems, but is still sort of more constrained than just saying, Turk has come up with some question to ask. And, you know, at, at that point, you know, it's a bet effectively that you're betting that, um, the, this might be a sort of an interesting level of difficulty for people to explore for working on scene understanding and you know it can certainly be criticized because our questions are still sort of art artificial when it comes down to it but we hope that they're sort of from a broad enough space that it's actually an interesting good challenge for developing um, visual scene understanding reasoning systems for a few years. Last question. Okay, first up, back scheme. Yeah. So, so, in your opinion, what do you think is the role of uh, logical inferences in, in these reasoning systems? Um, at least it seems to me that it might make sense for these models to know that if something is black, it cannot be red. If A is to the left of B and C is to the left of whatever, the transitive of leftness and so on. Um, do you think there is a role for logistic, uh, logical inference in these? Uh, um, so certainly there is a role for having more understanding of domains and being able to make use of that understanding. Um, so I mean there's perhaps slightly more of that than I sort of fully made clear, right? So that we do sort of so by construction, so 
when I said there was a space of concepts that we put into uh, taxonomy, so we actually are exploiting that taxonomy, and this is sort of how we have a kind of a hand done, a middly hand done, disentangled representation, so that we have sort of taxonomic concepts like colors, and so then for color, for the property of color, you'll have a tension distribution over different colors. So in a sort of a soft way, it is representing that the choice of colors are complementary from each other. So we are making some use of that kind of information, but there's certainly a lot of other um, reasoning information like sort of the ref um, to the left of and to the right of being re opposites we aren't capturing. So yeah, I think there is absolutely a role to be doing more inference of a logical character in future models. Okay. With that, let's thank Chris again for his...